Welcome to Season 5 of the Prosthetics and Orthotics Podcast with yours Peels and Brett Wright. We're bringing in industry experts, patients, vendors, and thought leaders to share their stories, insights, and visions for the future. Whether you're a clinician, a researcher, a vendor, or someone with a personal interest in the field, we have something for you. Join us as we delve into how advancements in personalized healthcare and 3D printing are revolutionizing the industry and changing the way we approach the design, production, and delivery of prosthetic and orthotic devices. Hello, everyone. My name is Joris Peels, and this is another episode of the Prosthetics and Orthotics Podcast with Brent Wright. How you doing, Brent? Hey, doing well. We're, we're doing a special episode today, aren't we? Yeah, we're doing a super special episode brought to us by Jess Potter. And uh, Jess Potter is an automation package that can help you automate uh, certain steps in your workflow from going from scan data to a orthotic or later on other device and uh, to something that can benefit your patient. So check them out uh, if you can. And yeah, well, Brent actually uses them. And uh, so we're actually happy to, it's good to have a sponsor that you actually know what the product is and, and actually uh, you, you, you can uh, uh, you, you use it yourself. So it's always a good sign, right? Oh yeah. Yeah. It's, it's really neat. And uh, I mean, I think the engine just behind the software is, is so great, uh, especially on the automation side of things. So I suggest anybody to uh, check it out. All right. So what is our special episode going to be about? Brent? Well, we're about 60 episodes in and mm-hmm. we've listened to a lot of, had a lot of great episodes, listened to a lot of people. And so this is kind of, Yoris, you're going to be on the hot seat a little bit of, mm-hmm. hey, mm-hmm. you know what? You're in this space a little bit more and you have people reach out to you all the time. Is there yeah. is there opportunity? Are there business opportunities? Are there opportunities to get better for people that are already in business? Um, you know, just from the things that we've heard. So it's it's going to be uh, your show today, Yoris. Oh, goodness. Okay. Uh, you didn't sell it to me like this initially. <laughs> <laughs> well, here we go. Oh, no. Oh, no. But Okay. So, so wait. Business opportunities at the intersection of, like, let's say, digitization, 3D printing, scanning, and, and ortho- uh, orthotics and prosthetics, right? That's right. Or, I mean, we can... I would say yes in the orthotic and prosthetic space for sure. Okay, okay, good. Okay, all right, all right. So, so the first thing I think I think the big opportunity I think is 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 like automation tooling for the automated fabrication of these devices, right? So, so, so we're talking like like maybe one device that manufactures, I don't know. Let's say talk about a three D printer that only manufactures carbon fiber components, but finished carbon fiber components for orthotics and prosthetics so that kind of localized manufacturing capability is a huge thing i think and then we're not talking necessarily yes there's an opportunity for 3d printers obviously but we're talking about like a little bit of like a like a production line for very specific devices so that you really have like a little bit of a line for yeah orthosis for example just completely from from you know from the scanning solution to the end just an integrated tool set you can buy or lease and then boom, you can do orthotics in your your store, and it's all also automated. I love that. I think that's a, but that also for like pretty much every tool or whatever labor intensive tool, because with labor being scarce, um, with productivity increasing, with us having better tools, that as a business is going to be, I think, a wonderful one. So that's that's one thing I think I think would be a really really big opportunity. Um, then I think it's also, you know, the centralized fab thing. We've talked about this, like becoming a centralized fab for. America, if you will, or the Southeast and being like kind of everyone's friend, but not being a, a tied to maybe the bigger ones is I think what I think is, is also going to be a huge opportunity to just t- t- say to a lot of th- people, hey, we're specialized in this one device. We do it better than you. And it's either something that's really labor intensive or something that's expensive or something people, maybe something that people hate to doing, you know, and it just said to people, hey, we can make those way cheaper than you can. And just pass it on to us, and becoming that uh, that really, really super specialized outsourcing partner. So not necessarily a service bureau, it just takes any geometry, but really saying, you know, we're going to do one particular um, implant or one particular component, and we're just going to run with it like more than anyone else can. And we're going to hyper specialize in it. Uh, that to me is 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 a really kind of uh, an interesting thing. I also think this is this is a bit of a leap one where I'm like more thinking of like. Um, uh, this is more uh, kind of like in the breakthrough thinking business development thing. Um, 
if we're looking at like if from a prosthetist kind of viewpoint, you are the only professional that the 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 a lot of people see that is 3D scanning people and acquiring geometry and digitizing it in a regular way, apart from like a 3D geometry, right? 2D geometry, there's tons of people that do that. So 3D geometry is 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 you're the only person that's doing this, right? Apart from maybe a radiologist in some cases, right? Mainly they're doing slices, right? Um, uh, but apart from maybe some some other kind of medical specialties, but mainly this is the only thing. Now, you've got all this infrastructure to see a certain set group of patients. That group of patients is actually quite small, but because these patients are all over the place, uh, there's like a lot of these little offices everywhere. So imagine, let's look at this opportunity much bigger and we say, look, everybody is unique. We know that there's going to be more mass customization things out there. We know that there is going to be uh, a lot more mass customization uh, uh, opportunities. Who's going to take that scan? Right. So imagine you got together with a whole bunch of process orthotist people and said, we're going to 3D scan these people and we'll scan your feet. And that means that, let's say, if I mind all hiking boots, um, mind all hiking boots and say, hey, for 50 bucks, you can go to this uh, office and then uh, we'll scan your feet and give you a 3D printed uh, uh, unique part. Right. So then the, the data acquisition is going to be done by the, your local orthotist and prosthetist because otherwise, who's going to do it? Well, the dude in the Nike store or something, the good dude in Nike town is going to be like, yeah, come here. I've got my AirTech Eva. It's going to be amazing, but right. Or you're going to see a, a fully, you know, a full 3D scan rig, a photogrammetry rig inside of a large store, you know? Okay. That's also possible. But I like the idea of, 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 of doing this. Now, in the example of the foot, it's not exactly super duper clear if that's a good case because I'm pretty sure HP has some tooling for this. I'm pretty sure you could actually probably do this in a Nike town. I try to do it in my own house with the comb scanner. I was medium successful in doing that myself, right? Uh, so, uh, you know, for shoes, for orthotics, yeah, maybe we don't need to do it. But let's look at another opportunity. Like, I'm, I'm, because for the 3D printing market, I'm, interv I'm interviewing and talking a lot of people about bicycles, right? And Bicycles, you might think it's just a normal thing, but right now there's racing bicycles where people pay five thousand, ten thousand dollars for a racing bicycle, right? And increasingly they're buying these things online. So it's a huge opportunity. There's a lot of 3D printed parts. And the, another opportunity is to have custom geometry. But what I'm finding out is that a lot of people have actually bought the wrong bike frame, right? Or they bought and they're sitting in a very aggressive stance, which maybe isn't good for them. It bent over a lot. Or maybe they, they, they just should move the steering wheel back a teeny weeny bit or the seat, which is very easy for them to do. Um, you know, in that case, you know, to, in order to sit on that bike properly. Now, this is bike fitters and there's people that do this, but there's not enough of them and there's no like recognized program for them. So imagine like an orthodox process taking on this bike fitting business. But imagine also looking at, for example, other assistive devices, right? Um, uh, imagine doing a fitting for somebody who has to uh, uh, wear like one of those, I don't know, those relators or something. I don't know, these little the things that, that help you walk or something. Or a wheelchair, right? I'm also finding out, I'm doing a lot of work on some work on wheelchairs at the moment. I'm also finding out that a lot of people just get given a wheelchair at one point. It's like, here you go, later. <laughs> some dude like right, drops right. it off. And you spend like years in this thing. <laughs> some dude like literally drops it off of your house or something. <laughs> so, right. so, so to me, like the advantage there is like, you know, if we have to fit people to the world and if we're seeing 3D printing and other co technologies customize it, there could be an opportunity for orthodox and process to say, you know what? We know people. We know custom parts. We know fitting. So on the one hand, we can do the acquisition, the 3D scanning. On the other hand, maybe we're the ones to 3D print custom handles for uh, wheelchairs, right? Uh, maybe we should be the ones to say, you know what? I can make you a custom uh, wheelchair uh, handle or maybe a, a glove, right? Yeah. Uh, or I can make you a custom fit your bike seat because I'm all about that kind of stuff. I am trained in trying to fit a person to geometry, and you're just doing the same thing with your bike. You're trying to have a device that you move with. And you know what? You're just a Muppet because you bought that thing for 10 grand and you have no idea if you actually fit well on it, right? But I do this for a living so I can help you fit it, right? Same thing for race car seats, for custom ski boots, for everything, right? So I think that's a much more broader opportunity for looking at this if we know 3D printing and if we know 3D scanning and if we're near a bunch of people and if we make stuff to fit to people, well, why not golf clubs? Right? <laughs> Why don't I? Right. You know, it would shake things up a little bit. You know, <laughs> Did some AFO dude, and then after that, some dude is going to nine iron. But right, but, right. But, but generally, you know, why not? Who else is going to do that? Right? It's either going to be Callaway, right, the golf brand, or it's going to be BMW, 
right? Or it's going to be somebody else. And there's no other kind of group out there that's really your radiologist isn't going to do it. They're going to be like, yeah, no, I'm not going to make golf clubs, right? The, the, so so, so there, there's a real opportunity there. And if we believe in this digitization, then we're like the people who fit stuff to digital stuff. So that's a, a bigger kind of opportunity. Is that doable? I don't know. I think you could do this on a small scale if you work with your local golf clubhouse or your local bike store or the local, you know, now to do this globally and all this, and uh, yeah, it's going to take a lot of work, but to try to offer this as a service bike fitting or to get into that as a side gig, eh, why not? Or to offer like a wheelchair fitting service, right? That's good. The other thing I think is a real opportunity is uh, the super premium assistive devices market. Um, which I've been looking at assistive devices market. It's horrible. It's like everything is gray. What is that? Is that a requirement? No, uh, every, every, <laughs> right. Everything is everything is the same kind of thing. And then you either have the European stuff, which is kind of very there are very few skew, and it's all very stodgy, or the American stuff, which is a bit all over the more all over the place. Um, but generally, nothing looks good. Nothing looks like it's designed within this century, right? Uh, nothing looks like it has any kind of no, mo modern techniques, right? Why isn't there like a super premium? Uh, what are those things called? Those little things that help you walk, like a not like a not a stick thing, but the other thing, you know, like little like, wheel devices would make old people walk. Why isn't there a super premium of that? You know? Oh, like a like a like a rollator or a walker yeah, that, type yeah, of thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. Why isn't there a super premium? Millionaires are going to have trouble walking. That's right. right? <laughs> <laughs> like really, so like, imagine poor Larry Ellison. He's going to get old, and what he has to go use the same rollator as me? Come on! Like, right, why right. isn't there like a Louis Vuitton of rollators? Or why doesn't Louis Vuitton make rollators? Right? Well, you know, or, or these walkers? Right? So there's an opportunity to have the super premium. But if you think about it, like, why isn't there a, a brand like that for I don't know uh, uh, African American people? or urban people, or uh, sportsmen, right? The active outdoor, you know what I mean? Or the kind of the outdoor set. I mean, there's real tree everything, but I bet yeah, you there's camouflage very little... everything. We should be good. <laughs> exactly. But there's real tree, almost everything, but I bet you there's very little real tree, uh, like assistive devices, you know? So I love this assistive devices. I love this idea of may, being able to make assistive devices that are premium or branded to a certain group, you know, or branded to a certain kind of like a city or something like that. The other thing I, I think is, is, is really kind of interesting is this market that is also unmet, right? And that's the idea. We This is something that has happened 50 times, but has never really happened. And th this is the story. And it comes out and comes to media. And it's one of these stories. It's like the chocolate story. And it's like, there's a person, usually it's a person with uh, like some kind of long-term disability, like a, a um, uh, what's that called, a quadriplegic or something like this. And they have designed together with somebody, let's call her Sarah, an assistive device that is unique to that person, right? So that means, um, you know, Bob wanted to play PlayStation and, and he has a particular set of circumstances and Sarah designs this one thing to, to let him play PlayStation, right? This, this is a huge opportunity. And no one is in a systematic deal way dealing with it. So nobody is doing like a kind of like a mass customization tool or an outreach to these people. Because uh, to imagine the quality of life improvement for, you know, the PlayStation example sounds maybe facetious, but there's also an example where Bob could do his work better or where his, like literally he may have to like move some kind of mouse or something like that with his mouth. And if that's a little bit more comfortable, that eight hours of his day are going to be a lot better. So there's a ton of like upside in for the patient and there's a ton of quality of life improvements and just these really custom custom devices right and who does custom devices again for patients and uh, absolutely nobody except for orthotists and prosthetists you know yeah and uh, the other ways it's like every single time i've tried to pitch this to a medical company they're like they're terrified of the liability because it's a unique device right right all right we're going to take a break right there and we'll be back with the rest of our show but we wanted to share with you another sponsor for the Orthotics and Prosthetic Podcast, which is Advanced 3D. Advanced 3D is your go-to solution for 3D printing expertise. Whether you're trying to figure out what software you're going to use, or you want help creating definitive sockets, test sockets, AFOs, foot orthoses, you name it, Advanced 3D can help you with your solution. All right, let's get back to the show. Yours will continue on. And I literally give him this example or variation. It's like one guy, Bob, who loves his PlayStation, he has a particular PlayStation, a particular controller, and he can't do this anymore. How can we make him do this? Because this is his favorite thing, you know? Imagine how much you'd pay for this. Imagine how happy it would make him, right? And they're like, yeah, but it's like for one dude. 
Yeah, that's never going to work. But for you guys, <laughs> you guys are like, oh, we do this all the time. He's not even walking on it? No, that's cool, right? Right, but I think, right. But I think your guys are just basically stopping in the stuff that that kind of, that is the regular defined stuff. You're not necessarily going into the thing like saying like, wait a minute, there's all these quadriplegic dudes out there and, and women. And maybe we um, maybe we make their lives better as well with these unique devices that are very specific to their use case, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, well, so I think that's, like, especially starting back at the bicycle thing. I mean, that's very interesting because you're absolutely right. We are experts in creating things for the body. And if, especially if there's some guidelines that go with some of this stuff, we can definitely help these outcomes be probably even a lot better, especially if there's somebody like I know a cyclist in uh, Las Vegas, that's a prosthetist and orthotist loves cycling. And, you know, he would love nothing more than to fit a few custom made bikes every now and then. And how cool would it be to be, you know, partnered with a big company, a Trek or a Cannondale and say, Hey, if you don't want to, if you don't feel comfortable online Mm -hmm. uh, ordering your bike, you can go see uh, these people at, you know, Joe's O and P shop and they will help you make sure that you get every, you know, your seat, right. Your top tube, right. All that stuff, geometry, perfect. So when you get your bike, it's actually perfect for you. And yeah, there's a, people that'll pay a premium for that. And and I think, no, you know, there should be the club, bike is 10 K, right? <laughs> oh yeah, sure. Yeah. And you know, same thing with the golf clubs and, and all the, like the hand stuff and the, uh, even when you get down to like seat cushions for wheelchairs and, and uh, you know, the sled hockey is a big deal for um, uh, people that are missing limbs and um, maybe have some uh, limb deficiencies, uh, but have their upper extremity ability. Um, there's, there's a whole bunch of different ways those people present. And there's a lot of things that could be very innovative uh, that would not only help them, but then help somebody else that's like them down the road. And I think that's really neat. Yeah, yeah I think that's super cool. I mean, I think, I think the bike thing is a, is a beautiful example, but it's also interesting to see how I came up with this, right? So this is really interesting. So all the time I'm trying to invent stuff and see if it works. And oftentimes it goes nowhere. But this is, in this case, I was trying to look at kind of uh, feet and making feet more comfortable, hands and gloves and handles. I'm, I'm obsessed with handles and sports gear. And then I try to figure out like how to make the best either glove for cyclists or the kind of like a handlebar kind of cushion kind of thing, right? And I found out that actually most of the pain is caused that people have the wrong frame size, right? Or they're sitting incorrectly on the bike because they never went to like a lesson to sit on a bike. They just like started off, you know? And before you know it, they're doing like 60 kilometers a day or something or whatever. And they're just like, they have no idea what they're doing, right? And I know so many people... Like one of my friends, this is this is actually kind of crazy. One of my friends messed up his knee because he decided to go jump roping in a big way, and he just like completely messed up his knee jump roping. Right? A couple other of my friends went into running in a big way when they were thirty and ended up messing up their knees by the time they were forty. Right? Whereas the guys that went into biking all end up owning like ten thousand dollar bikes, and then you know, but they don't, they still have their knees. So, so you know. Right, right. By and large, it's all right, right? So, so for all these things, we keep seeing that 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 we invest money and time in something and we get really passionate about it. That's exactly what companies are looking for, but nobody gets started with it in a proper way, you know? Um, and, and, and this is why I think it was really funny. The glove thing looked like a good idea. And then I was like, but wait a minute, I'm going to cushion this guy's hands cause he's pressing down too much cause he's sitting incorrectly cause his handlebars are too close to him. And then I'm going to cushion that. That just sounds like a, that sounds like a really stupid thing to do. You know, <laughs> it's like a really stupid product. Like I'm like, you should go to have a bike fit. So that's how I come up with this idea of like that sometimes it's better to, to monetize a thing. But if we look in the extension of this, um, I know you guys don't like to talk about it. But America has a, a, a pretty significant obesity problem, right? Mm-hmm. So there's lots of ways we can help these people as well with certain devices and making their life easier as well. And also in really critical things. Like I think about a person like this, getting the initial exercise, right? is going to be incredibly difficult because, but the initial exercise is going to, if done successfully, add maybe decades to this person's life if, he, if they continue. So there's no way of motivating this person or getting them there. Uh, and also there's no way to get them assistive devices and things to make their life easier. So that's also like this kind of, so there's also a role here. Like if you look at the, the ideal trauma patient, right? Workflow. We talked about this before a couple of times, right? Is you work with a doctor, 
right? She sends the patient to you. There's a manual therapy, whatever kind of therapy kind of thing going on as well. We work with them. And then the orthotist prosthetist is there making the device. And then in a magical thing, never happens apparently, but everyone works together and it's fine. But how can we imagine we, we, we take this to obesity as well, right? And we take like a dietitian, and we take like a, some kind of motivational person and we all together solve those kind of problems, right? Now imagine like you're like, yeah, but that never works. I'm never going to get reimbursed in that. But what if you just charge that as a thing, right? What if we do that like as a Tybo, but then instead of that, we do that as an integrated kind of healthcare thing. Well, the patient group for that and the health impact for that is, is huge, right? And especially in the United States of America, but also in, increasingly in, in many other places in the world. And, and those places are the richest thing. And these patients are not really being cared for. They're being cared for as in when they die, uh, they get a heart attack, so they get cared for, but nobody's dealing with them. They're actually like their, their health journey. It's all about like, you know, buckle up and, you know, get out there, you know, like, and then it's like, what, <laughs> you don't think, you don't think he's tried this, you know? So, so there's right. nobody like, uh, you know, helping them. There's no coach for them, you know? And so th this is like, kind of like, I don't know if this is going to be a good business. The ones before this, I'm pretty sure all of them would be at least like worthwhile businesses. But this one, I'm like, I don't know if it's a business, but if we look at the, the major societal problems, then I think that that is one of them. That is one of the, that, that affects everything, right? Uh, uh, in, in certain countries. And that affects a lot of, like the whole system. If we were talking about a third or more of people that are obese, then the whole system and the, the your taxes and how far your money goes, all of that is going to be affected. But there's no one really, you know, solving that except for some people selling like some diet pills and stuff. So that's that's also like there's these things like how can we apply ourselves to these giant problems that no one's solving? Right. Well, and uh, I think in the U.S. though, I mean, the thing that's difficult about that is how how can we um, get paid for some of that stuff, right? So yeah, but I mean, but, how much, but imagine that if you ask me, right, and you found okay, maybe, and you just ask me to say because I'm looking at all these bills, I'm looking at paying like. I need to pay for, like, at one point I'm going to have to pay for insulin. At one point I'm going to have to pay for, for all sorts of things. And I know that if I'm going further, then they're going to like, take my foot away and all this stuff, you know. So I'm looking at a mountain of bills. I'm looking at a, a really, really bad health outcome. May, but, okay, I, could tell, I can go to the gym, right, if I wanted to. But I think if I'm, like, I'm really in a bad place, I'm not, that's not going to be, I don't want to go to the gym, you know. Right. <laughs> that's not going to be a place where I'm going to feel really comfortable. But, but, um but at the same time, like, like, you know, I might, I would maybe pay for that. You know what I mean? In, in, in a financial way, it makes, it totally makes sense. Right. Uh, but also in a motivational way, it totally makes sense as well. I mean, it's, it's tough because, you know, the, the mindset in America is if my insurance won't pay for it, then I'm not going to pay for it. Yeah, yeah. But at the same time, you will pay for like a, you know, a hundred dollar polo or something like that. I know, buy like five hundred dollars oh, sunglasses. Uh, uh, yeah, well, and and you put a satellite out in front of your you know your house and, oh, yeah. and pay two hundred dollars a month for TV with your fifteen hundred dollar phone yeah. and hundred dollars. So all all those things. Oh, how how do we? Yeah, I mean, I think it's yeah, okay. that's it's it's a balance, right? So while I love the idea of of that and being able to get somebody out and moving, especially like on a set of foot orthoses, it's okay. So what does, what does that look like, um, to, to make that happen? And, and maybe though it's, it's some of the messaging behind it. They, they don't even know that it's available, right? So if you, if you're able to say, use an FDM printer to create some foot orthoses for a minimal cost and you, and you fit, them or somehow the scan or whatever, and you're able to get them super cost effective, then you get somebody moving or say you do partner with a, a, sh a shoe company that specializes in fitting shoes, but don't necessarily have a foot orthosis side of things. Um, you know, maybe that's an option, but I, I would also go to say, you know, there's a whole specialty, uh, that is not orthotists and prosthetists that focus on feet called pedorthics. And, and the, uh, so pedorthics is different, definitely different than, um, podiatry. Podiatry is a, like a doctorate program. Pedorthist is, is a, a like a short course sort of thing, plus a certification. And so the, the, those are types of things that I have to keep in mind too, is, you know, even though fitting, say, something for the foot or something may be part of our scope of practice, 
it's it's not necessarily the best use okay. of okay. what we do now but getting all that stuff back with like the the um like the bicycle and things like and and even some of the wheelchair stuff because that goes along with back braces and all that stuff that makes a lot of sense for prosthetist orthotists but who knows you know if there is a business case for some of these foot orthoses things or the bicycle thing or these seats i think there are some orthotists and prosthetists that may make a jump and say hey this is better than dealing with insurance companies and all that stuff. Yeah, as a side gig, I think I think it could be interesting to explore some of this and getting your revenue from different sources. I think I think it's also like think imagine like I think I still think the the most amazing opportunity like think about something like the U.S. Army or something like this and just what is it? It's a whole bunch of people walking around a lot, right? Yeah. So if they would just walk around a lot a little bit better, like they, they would totally invest in this. Right, they, they would totally invest in this. You can tell that their people are a little bit less fatigued, and they're 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 gonna, you know, just just be 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 a little bit less uh, bit of an, or operationally rapid ready and all this kind of stuff. It really has a big difference for them, not only in a wartime situation, but also just regularly. They just have a lot of people walking around, <laughs> so the ergonomics of their whole world is 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 also very very important. And as is the same situation for any company that has a ton of employees um uh you know so the, the that ergonomics of that and that you know reducing these problems before they get there is, is also a huge opportunity and there's also nobody that does that custom right so that's the other thing so custom ergonomics for there's there's an ergonomic consultant that could tell you like you need a standing desk or you need to st- sit straight or something like that right but there's no one that can make you devices or or, or things that that really kind of like make sense for you or that can, like, for example, give you all orthoses, right? So that, to me, I think uh, is, is a huge opportunity. And the same thing, again, elder care, the same thing. They will want only very, very unique devices, and there's no one set up to do that for them. Now, maybe their insurance doesn't pay for certain things, but it's certain is really some per- people are really into sitting in a particular chair and, and working with a particular remote control. They may want to just pay for that, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and then we're talking about like the largest generation ever is going to be sitting around for the lo- much longer time than than before, right? So 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 what we're seeing this in, in I've been looking at this through the lens or the, um, uh, for implantology and stuff like this, and we see a, a what we call like a kind of confluence of mega trends where people are living longer, right? They don't need to get one hip implant; they get two, right? Right. They have a higher expectation of what they're going to do. Before it was like. Uh, Hey, you're 60 years old, 65 years old or something. You're going to sit behind and watch TV and maybe drink the old beer and that's it. You know, now you want to travel, you want to go around and you want to explore and run and take up all sorts of stuff, you know? So we're going to have a much, much larger uh, population than before all sitting around. Well, not sitting around actually being much more active than before and having a higher expectation of what to do, right? We already know that that's going to really affect the implantology market, but what about, you know, what are these people? Okay, so I want to play golf, and now I don't want to stop playing golf when I'm 89. So is there anything that can help me? You know, are there people that make like a uh, you know golf clubs for Parkinson people or something like that, or just something like? Imagine this. It's not going to work long term, but what if it just made me play golf a little bit? You know, I, I would have to stop golf normally in June, but now I can play golf for another three months. And then I know that after that, I can never play golf again, right? So, so, so this is like the motivation is very high for me. So imagine you can make an assistive device for that guy, right? Or imagine his life. Like, imagine this. One of your top things, I have this thing where with a bunch of friends every Saturday, we go to eat like a sandwich and we talk about life and all this, whatever. It sounds boring. It's probably boring. We go to a museum. We talk about art, whatever, right? But that's really important to me, and I, I would, it would suck to me if I didn't have that anymore. But imagine you went with your four friends, like, and you got your little golf, you went to play golf every Saturday, and that becomes a big part of your life in your 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 golden years, if you will. At one point, you're getting a golf cart, right? And uh, you know, and then you all go on the golf court because hey, you know, the, the, the no spring chickens anymore thing. But then at one point, you can't fit in the golf cart anymore because you have some kind of disability or something like that, or you find it difficult to get in that cart. That sucks because now all of a sudden you're going to be going home and hearing about how everyone, how everybody uh, got a hole in one, right? Right, so, right. So think about just that that specific situation. So we're all thinking about the same thing. We have a unique geometry, a unique problem, and we have somebody willing to pay for it. That's beautiful, right? That's what that's that's kind of is what I call this application window. So we have a product that solves a, a problem, 
that actually somebody wants to pay with, and it's technically feasible, right? And if that person would know about this problem and know that we would solve it and know the price that we could do that, he would, he or she would then actually be able to give the requisite amount of money to solve that problem. I mean, that's what I call application window. I still don't know if that's language that everyone else uses or it's my own little internal thing. So it's not like it's a product because it's cool. It's not like a product because it's like we make money on it. Or we, it's not a product because it has margin or it has it's functional. You know, it's it's we we're we're, we're solving a real problem. No one else can solve. I forgot to say this the first time around. No one else can solve, or very other companies or technologies can solve, and people will pay for it and happily pay for it. Now, usually the problem is a lot of these business cases don't work because then you do a little bit of research and you find, oh, there's only like 100,000 and there's only 1,000 people that would want this, right? Who wants like a special way to to be able to get into a golf, like a, you know, you know, you have the, one of these chairs, these swing chairs to get into golf uh, um, to, to, to cars, right? There's right. one company in America, I think they start with a B or something, they make a ton of these things like that to get people, wheelchair bound people into cars, right? That's an industry, right? But who's doing this for golf carts? I don't know. Maybe it exists, right? But is it going to exist? It should, right? But then you yeah. have another case that I'm missing one leg or I'm uh, able to move one leg well and I'm not able to pivot on my right leg and I can't get into my golf cart. That's not a reduced mobility situation that you guys normally encounter, right? Right. But imagine how important that golf cart, that weekly outing with his buddies is to that one guy, you know? Right. And imagine that the, the, that person would totally be able to pay for it. Now, Normally, again, these business cases don't work because there's too few people, right? But I'm thinking that this group is going to get a much bigger, first off. I'm thinking they're going to have pretty much a lot of money, right? And I'm thinking that quality of life is going to depend on on, on, on an increasingly or decreasing number of things that they're going to be increasingly passionate about, while as they're going to be more, have a higher degree of apathy for the rest of the world, right? So just generally, you know, normally you wouldn't be able to solve a solution like this because it's only one part. But we're thinking that if we have the 3D scanning ability, if we have the person that has the ability to make devices fit to humans and, and to make those humans, along with the devices, be more mobile uh, in the world and more functional in the world, well, if we have that kind of person and that, that person gives in some time, then you could make a device like this. Yeah, right? well, I think and, it, I, and yeah. I think, yeah, I mean, so when you frame it like that, hey, especially orthodox and prosthetics, you guys are – the yeah. you know fitters of the body and yeah, exactly. then you also provide solutions mm -hmm. of anything that has to do with mobility mm -hmm. and exactly. fit right and yeah. and so it's almost like this prosthetist or orthotist can quarterback some of this stuff they don't necessarily even know how to need to know how to design but what they have to do is say hey okay here's the here's the problem i think i know what the solution is we need to do X, Y, and Z with the seat. We need to move this here, here, and here. And then you find somebody that's able to do that solution, print it, and deliver it. And I think yeah, that's exactly. pretty neat. Exactly. Sorry. And there's two, I'll give you two extreme examples of this that would expire when you think like this. And one is, I'm going to have to kind of semi-anonymize this example. A friend of mine used to work on a boat, sailing yacht, and they would pay about a million dollars a year in maintenance to that boat. <laughs> It was a private yacht, right? And this person owned it. And they had like uh, six people on the boat and they would do maintenance. And they're basically on these yachts, you, you got to like essentially you start painting it. And then when you're done, you start painting it again, right? You do right. maintenance all the time. I can't imagine. And they're just, this is like a, let's say 40 meter plus sailing yacht, right? And they were just working on these things all the time. And then all of a sudden the owner didn't come, right? And why did the owner not come? Well, the owner was an elderly gentleman, right? And uh, he, he just was quite wheel, wheelchair bound, right? And it was just not a very feasible idea having him on the yacht. He loved that yacht, all right? And he actually had a couple of them, which is kind of funny. But, um, and, and he couldn't go on it at one point, right? And so for years, these guys, like, kind of Sisyphean, in a Sisyphean way, kind of maintain this yacht without the dude coming on board it, right? It was really kind of really bizarre situation. On the one hand, we're lucky because we're sailing for a living, right? You know? And on the other hand, we're maintaining a boat that may never actually see, you know, anything kind of any adventure that it was built for, you know? Right. Uh, so what would that guy, who's obviously very wealthy because, you know, what would that guy have paid to kind of properly kind of wheelchair proof to get a kind of ramp or a kind of infrastructure so he could still use this, right? At the time, they customized everything on the yacht. But at the time, no one had kind of thought about this, right? 
But that's the, the, the other example. Like, so that's the extreme example. On the one hand, there is always going to be an ultra wealthy group of people, but well, they're going to want to pay for this and they're going to be able to. The other example is is my aunt who was not an ultra ultra wealthy individual, but she loved puzzles, right? And the idea is that she wanted a particular magnifying glass of the puzzle, but she had a little bit of a problem with her, her motion uh, kind of control, and she had a particular table set up. So for her, puzzles were as like uh, her, her uh, uh, like, like, you know, was, was the one mentally challenging thing she did, right? But the thing is, she could not find a particular magnifying glass that would allow us to still see, still see the puzzle on the table she had, and that would allow her to, to, to hold it in the proper way that she still could. Now, she would have paid a lot of money for that device. I don't know if that's, that would have meant that it would have been a lot of money in total. But a kind of customized device like that could, have, could be really interesting. Now, on the other hand, maybe there's a lot of people that want to do puzzles. And a lot of people have this kind of uh, need a new kind of magnifying glass to work for them. And then there's a, a broader market in that kind of product. So productizing this, this, uh, this thing might also be a good idea as well. Well, so, I, yeah, and I love those those examples and especially like the yacht stuff. Hey, how do we get together with these the builders and say, hey, these are some of the things that you can do to help this person enjoy some of the activities? What is the stuff? What does it need to look at? Like, you know, tie downs on the deck or wheel chocks or whatever that, that he can kind of have some of the freedom that he had to uh, to enjoy what he's invested in and uh, you think about that and it's interesting that you talk about kind of the humanized side of this the enjoying life uh side of things because i think that is so important because once once that mental health goes where you don't have the opportunity to be with your buddies or opportunity to be uh doing the things that you love i think so goes the the will to live too and so how yeah, totally. how valuable is that so i love that um there's, there's also an opportunity there's one more in, in the same vein that's how let's just deal with these one so and and that's the really interesting that uh, uh i used to work for a company like phillips and we had this ergonomics like this department essentially that did all this right and that would give you all sorts of things but they wouldn't have like ergonomic solutions for everyone. So I looked for a while and trying to say, hey, could we help you? But that was a bit difficult for them to conceive of these custom devices. But you know, where are you the most likely to 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 get killed? It's your bathroom. Right? So you could you could buy some ba- some baby proofing items, but there's no like way to ergonomically proof your your home now, right? There's very little you could buy maybe an anti-slip towel, maybe there's some standardized products, but there's no customized ergonomics engineering person that's gonna make your house safer. Right? That's gonna troop through your house and say, look, this is dangerous, we're gonna get rid of this, we're gonna get rid of this, we're gonna get rid of that. Right? Everybody there's like tons of stuff. My my sister just got a baby, so there's tons of like little products for them to make their house safe, and they did this whole pass of like, oh my goodness, you know. But for older age, right? There's not really that, that similar kind of product offering. And theoretically, there should be a person that goes around and just takes away all the most hazardous things, right? Um, and then there's also some, some interesting treatment things here. I have uh, a friend of mine has, uh, what is it, uh, Alzheimer's, let's say. And for things like that, there are certain things that they would really benefit from from, 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 from having like kind of like assisted devices. And also there's certain things where you would like have a custom lock to keep them away from the, the gas furnace, you know what I mean? Right, and there's there's no real person set up to do this, right? But the reality is, we're going to not have enough people, right, to take care of all these people with Alzheimer's, all these people with older uh, situations. We may have the money to invest in them, but there's no person, there's no profession that I know of, at least, that does like, uh, you know, that does that kind of like that kind of makes a, a, a house safe for an Alzheimer's patient or makes it so the Alzheimer's patient can stay longer in their home. And the same thing with elderly or something. There's, there's, you know, you have a, you know, there's stair lifts and stuff. There are products, right? But there's no like service saying, call us and we'll go through your house and suggest a hundred things that you can do to, uh, to improve your life day to day. You know, it's more like you have a specific problem of getting into the bath, right? And then you look online, there's like, oh, look, there's a bath elevator or there's like a bath, uh, there's a bar or something like that to help you. So there's only, but given the fact that we're getting like, a, you know, hundreds of millions of, of, of ultra wealthy people having a much longer kind of golden years thing, I'm thinking like, where's the entrepreneurial activity to take care of that? Because there's no one really looking for those, those opportunities. Mm-hmm. 
No, I think that's that's pretty interesting. So there is a service in my um, sister in law. So my yeah. um, so my wife's brother's wife. Okay. Yeah, there yeah. we go. So she's a physical therapist, and uh, the name is escaping me right now. But what they've done is allowed uh, people that need help. Uh, so kind of in those golden years and you can choose your level of help. So whether it's a certified nursing assistant or an uh, RN yeah. and it's an app and literally they, it's like, you know, the dating sites, you, you match up and you, and you pay them directly through the app. And so they've set this whole thing up as kind of like a, uh, contract, person and some of these people are doing really really well with it but i love kind of that forethought of hey this is a need these people are going to have needs and it can be as simple as i'm going to drive you to the grocery store or i'm going to make you the meals or i need full-time care helping walk get me to the beach put my feet in the ocean whatever it is um but they have (laughs) there's an app for that uh, as far as help for people and so i think that is pretty interesting on the help side of things. But then mm-hmm. though that same aspect can be applied to what you were saying is we come and take mm-hmm. a look and s- see what is needed. How can we make this more accessible? How can we make sure that we extend your independence as long as possible? Yeah, exactly. But imagine how much that moves that, that means to you. Exactly. Like you said before, but also as the society, this is also going to be a really beneficial thing. There's like, I think it's around 20% of people are over 65 now. Uh, but at one point that's going to grow to about 30% in 2050 or something like this. Oh, now, apart wow. from the, that this is demographically a bit of a, uh, a problem. Um, you know, if a third of people need, well, at one point, not a third of people would need assistance, of course, because that group would would, would, would be reduced. But if such a great new number of people have, a, well, first off, who's doing products for these people? Not that many people because everybody wants to sell products to 18-year-olds and stuff, right? Mm-hmm. So there's not enough entrepreneurial activity ca- taking care of that. So I think that the example of your uh, your sister uh, app there is a really, really great one. Um, but also going forward, it's, like, it's also like we know we need some kind of device for getting these guys in and out of bed. Because there won't be a guy to help you get in and out of bed. It's that simple. There won't be, unless you're like, a, whatever, some super rich dude. But for most uh, other people, you know, we need some kind of in-house robotics kind of whatever capability. And we're not talking like some, like, dude, hi, I'm G, use your care robot. But but just like, you know, a way to get out of bed easier or a way to, you know, just do the, 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 the you know, for example, getting dressed, right, is now a uh, kind of very difficult thing. But if we're going to have like hundreds of millions of people have the same problem, shouldn't we be designing clothes that makes it easier to get dressed with one hand or that makes it easier for you to get dressed by yourself, right? Or chairs that do this or something, you know what I mean? And there's just not enough going into this foresight into the market. And that's, of course, you know, zig when others zag, right? You know, there will be a time when there's like enthusiasm about this, but now everyone's still trying to figure out what the kids want. Well, let's let's figure out what granddad and grandma and grandma need, Right. Because the kids don't have any money anyway. <laughs> the current structure. Right, right, hundred <laughs> percent. So, so, um, so generally, I think I think that's the opportunities that people are, are, are like. And I, and I see that if we look at this really high level kind of helicopter ish, yeah, we've got a group of people that are the only people that are also in in some cases the only people allowed to make a custom uh, medical type device. Let's call it that way. Um, that deals with that is made uniquely to solve a particular problem to make them that person better fit the world together with the device, and that's kind of a unique thing because like and also because like if we a hundred years ago well maybe there's an orthotist or prosthetist that could that could do that but there would also be a carpenter right there would also be uh, you know somebody who's good at sewing and making clothes who could do something at least right but nowadays um, in today's society. These other people, these other groups of people that could make these custom items are increasing and falling away. CNC shops in America are declining and closing. Um, um, you know, the types of places that can really do uh, have a lathes and other kind of machine tools that are accessible to, to, to just regular people are also declining. Right. So there, there aren't that many people in society that could do this. There, there could be an alternative to making custom things. Right. So that's the other option. I think if we are going to be a 3D printing person, or uh, uh, if we're going to have these 3D printers, well, why don't we start our own zoometry, right? 
Or if we're going to have these 3D printers and 3D scanners, why don't we just offer that as a broader so uh, service, right? Why don't we try to get people to come to us besides that uh, patient group that we're already kind of getting in, you know? And to me, the constraint is really on the, the fact that the current demand has you locked into a particular group that's really well re regulated and you're the little guy, right? And right. especially in the United States political system, that tells me that you are going to get beat up by everyone else. The insurer, the, the, the big hospitals, the, the, the big device companies, you know, unless you start some giant lobby thing, you know, the, you're going to get the short end of the stick, right? right. So to me, it's like, do we want to double down on that market or do we want to diversify? And the logical, logical thing for anyone else would be, well, of course we're going to diversify. We can't be dependent on the situation, but you, because you've chosen a profession that you're super passionate about, you may just think about doubling down. And then I'm like, well, but we don't have to give up the prosthetic stuff. We could just augment it with other similar activities. So that's also the higher level thinking by why to come up with specifically these ideas. Well, and it gives a lot of opportunity. So let's say let's say I come up with a product X Y Z to help this thing. Well, now I can also help my friend in California mm -hmm. who has somebody that's the same thing. I've already done the hard work, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and we make a difference there. And that's mm -hmm. that's one way. You know, everything is yes, it's one off, but can can we build on the knowledge of other people? And man, how cool would it be to have some sort of repository of like, hey, I did this for this person that presents this way. You might be able to use it, and then super nice. Uh, and then, and then, you know, you create this ecosystem of, and this kind of goes to the, and not necessarily that you're going to open source it, but you have this group think of ideas of how to take care of this problem or, and give some solutions to the aging population or solutions to a specific pathology or, or what have you. And you've got this resource that not only clinicians can go to, but say loved ones can go to, or the people that need the help can go to and say, Oh, Hey, look, Brent is in North Carolina, but he's also connected to George who is in New Mexico. And maybe they can work together to, get a solution yeah yeah i like that i think that's a it's, i've seen this in several different ways i like the idea of this just collaborating working together maybe you design the stuff i test it somebody else you know, fits it you know what i mean i love that idea that there's a maximalist kind of vision but i think it's a really really nice kind of vision to have this kind of like all the the all the whole world solution platform you know right. and either doing this on a kind of like a heal the world kind of basis free you're on your own you know i can't i can't give you any kind of liability but it's here right? right or as a real service of doing tried and tested things and and then doing identifying markets like uh i think that'll be really really if it's one of these things the problem with this is that it's youtube-ish in the sense that everybody knew that youtube was coming and everybody knew the video was the thing and everybody knew the broadwind was the thing and the newspapers were telling us and all this but you know, to actually be YouTube, that's just like little fine sauce, little tweaks in a sauce kind of things that, that are very difficult to actually do, right? Right. Uh, to get it right. Like, for example, if, if it would have been on the YouTube team and we said, well, we need to get ads in from the beginning so people don't walk away once we do try to monetize it. We need to have good quality video. We can't use Flash, right? Uh, you know, all those things. <laughs> and, it, it's, and, and, and definitely we can't use pirated content because then we're going to suit out of business. And those are all the things that made YouTube successful. Right, so so it, it's very difficult to 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 even know while you're being successful what success is and how to define it. Is it users, for example, right? Yeah, and well, YouTube's case, great, it was right, and that's but a great it, example but it, too, as yeah. far as like the YouTube thing, right? The, who is the biggest YouTuber? Yeah. It was this guy that no started idea. YouTubing ten years ago that was twenty or thirteen years old, and yeah. now he's what twenty three, twenty four, oh, Mr. Beast. Really? Oh yeah, yeah. He's got millions. Of, uh, he's the biggest YouTuber on the planet. I didn't know. I didn't know. Yeah. And what's interesting about that, though, is I think that's that should be an encouragement to both people that are older and younger. Is hey, you can contribute um, to this growth. But you know, he was not an overnight sensation. It took ten years for him to build this kind of credibility, and now it's just exploded. In the same sort of way, it's these, how do you get better 
every day <laughs> um, mm-hmm. using this platform that you, you may or may not be successful on, but yet at least gaining the experience. And then who knows, maybe you will blow up uh, or mm-hmm. you get this, become this expert in whatever mm-hmm. um, thing that you play in. And then specifically tying it back into this care, you know, it takes a few years to make it on the radar of you doing some of this stuff. And sometimes it may seem in vain, but, you know, and I'm just using my stuff as an example, as an orthotist and prosthetist in the 3D printing realm. It's been interesting, like people are now sharing some of the stuff, some of the work that I've done, you know, three, four years ago as state of the art. And, you know, yes, it was hard and, but that's not state of the art. Now we're so far ahead of where we were then, but it is in the minds of everybody else state of the art. And so how do we build on that? I think that really becomes the question. Yeah, it sounds really good. It sounds really good. I think one more thing I think I think I want to point out. I think I think the points are really super valid, super good. I think I think totally you're you're there. But one point I want wanna if you're really if someone's listening to this and they're thinking, oh wow, how do I implement it? It sounds a bit overwhelming, right? Um the idea to do it um is to either do one very simple example, right? Or to do things like for example, if you if you said if you came to the conclusion that no one was repairing their bicycles, right? And and you wanted to start a bicycle repair store, but that was like not happening for anyone. You didn't know if you had the investment. You didn't know if somebody would do it. Like that wouldn't really, you know, saying you would start a bicycle repair store wouldn't really work for anyone, right? That's not going to, you know, you're not going to get on your local right, newspaper. Right. That. But starting like a repair lab, right? This is Tasha. She's super passionate about old things. And she thinks that old technology should live again. And starting like a repair lab, right? Would get news, right? They'd be like repair lab here in uh, Ocean, whatever, right? Right, that would be interesting. And then you can talk about radios. You can talk about television. You can talk about repairing cups. You can talk about kintsugi, right? Whether we repair the Japanese things with gold. You can talk about all those things, and that's a really big theme, right? So if you're an entrepreneur and you connect with a bigger theme, not just a bicycle repair shop, but that everyone, everything is being thrown away, planned obsolescence, and people want things to last longer, right? Mm-hmm. Then you have a bigger marketing thing to sell but also what's interesting is if you have a repair lab and everybody knows that and uh in this town in california you have the repair lab then somebody's going to come in one day with a uh, a walking stick right another guy's going to be like i have a hole in my pool that no one fixes right the other guys you know what so you're going to end up with things that may end up being random but by inspiring people to come to you you may be able to solve other problems they have, right? And you may figure out that, for example, that no one is repairing glasses or that uh, actually that there's no motorcycle repair store in your region, right? There's right. lots of car ones. There actually are some bike repair stores or people are throwing away their bicycles rather than repairing them. Uh, but on the other hand, like, um, you know, you might find the actual business opportunity is actually motorcycles, right? So that randomness is going to happen if you start something like a repair lab, the universal repair lab, of uh, Southern California, right? Bring everything to me and I'll repair it, right? And then you can find with that kind of a grab bag approach, you not only have the vision, the interest of people, but also people are going to come home with super random stuff, right? Right. Uh, and maybe you find out that welding services is the key or that uh, that, uh, that uh, people will pay to repair heirlooms or that people want to restore old photos, you know, or want to digitize them, right? right? So that's the kind of way to approach these kind of ways, at least in an initial stage, is to rather than say, I'm going to repair bicycles, which no one's going to care about, it's not going to be relevant, it's not going to be newsworthy, it's not going to bring in new, uh, other feedback, it's not going to bring in a lot of people either in one go. Just so start a repair lab to repair things, right? So that's a, if you were actually trying to implement one of the things we talked about, I would do it in this kind of a way uh, rather than just you know spending like the next 17 months of your life uh, trying to develop the ultimate handlebar for a bicycle. Mm-hmm. Uh, because and then only to find out that uh, you know hypothetical here, <laughs> only to find out that everyone's sitting incor- incorrectly on their bicycles. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, but 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 that's the way I would do it. Just to do it in a more broader approach, and then um, and then you'll get uh, more feedback and more interesting things, and maybe you find your next business in a kind of more random way as well. But anyway, okay, yeah. I thought yeah. this was great. Yeah, I thought this was fun, and, and and it's it's just a different way to think, right? So it's like. We have this niche skill, mm-hmm. and can we use it and diversify? You know, mm-hmm. can we? It's it's 
it's this whole thing, especially the American system with the insurance and all that stuff. It's it's a pain, and I know I know that there are companies out there that are say, you know, I would prefer to have this as part of my business, but not all mm-hmm. my business. Well, mm-hmm. how do we take our skills and make it so it becomes part of our business, but we're diversifying and mm-hmm. still making a difference in patients' lives, people's lives, so they still will continue doing the things that our goals are is that they live a very productive uh, life doing the things that they love to do and Mm -hmm. uh, with as much independence as possible. And I think that's what we're good at. Cool, man. I agree. I agree. I would like to thank all of you. Thank you for this lively discussion. First off, I would like to point out we did this without preparation. We just started off with the questions and we launched into it. Uh, and uh, and uh, so I'd like to thank you very much for the lively discussion, uh, uh, Brent. And thank you guys for listening. And uh, you have a great day today.